All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the main room. Uh, we have a few minutes left uh, in the session today, so we're going to give uh, each of the groups that uh, got to the uh, creating a poster part a chance to uh, talk a little bit about what they did and um, yeah, basically what you struggled with, what you liked, didn't like, uh, how well it worked. So the first one is Team Fiji. If someone from this slide wants to talk a little bit about what they did, I know that you're maybe not 100% finished with all your posters, but that's totally fine. Okay. <clears throat> oh, my partner Malakai. <laughs> Uh, Sorry, I am. Uh, I was on mute. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Ryland. Thank you for the assistance. Uh, yes, uh, we tried to insert a few images, but we had uh, some difficulties in setting those uh, images that we've done. Anyway, uh, we use this uh, global lens. That, can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Yeah. We yes, can hear you. yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, we use uh, this global imagery, uh, Landsat imagery uh, for 2017 to 2019. Uh, uh, what worked was, uh, yeah, what, what first we did, because there's only two of us, so we divided uh, the two main islands, uh, uh, one to do the main in Vitilevu, which is on the south, and one is uh, do Unilevu, which is on the north. So we divided ourselves to do the classification. We had four samples, uh, feature samples each for the forest, the non-forest and water bodies. Uh, like we, I mentioned, uh, we used three, the three years uh, imagery from 2017 to 2019. The classification worked well according to uh, uh, the visualization that he's showing. However, what we assume uh, might not work well is the water bodies because uh, uh, you know in the region um, in the Pacific uh, the the water bodies is so small and uh, it will not peak in uh, global satellite imageries uh, like uh, Landsat but there might be other images that uh, can clearly show uh, good resolutions uh, that covered uh, what, what worked well uh, what didn't work uh, we yeah we thought of uh, doing more uh, you know adding more imageries uh, like uh, other not not only landsat images but uh, other image uh, imageries uh, we we might be uh, contacting uh, Ryan and his team to uh, to add in more uh, images uh, for for our samples how many samples yes we did four. Uh, what did change? We, we, we just uh, changed the years uh, from 1997 to uh, 20, 2017 to 2019. What would you like to do next? Well, uh, as you know, uh, uh, you know we are focusing on uh, on, on uh, forest and uh, forest classification. Uh, what would uh, interest uh, me in particular, uh, since we are working uh, on uh, the effect of uh, uh, of the our maritime boundaries limits due to climate change is to uh, classify uh, coastal changes and to see how it affects our maritime boundaries limits uh, in the region. Uh, that's uh, from my end. Um, yeah, and that's what I would like to apply for in the future. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, so we'll go to the next one here. Whoa. Uh, Break up room four, Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, Tonga. Does someone from your group want to talk about what you did? Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we managed to do the classification for uh, forest, non-forest, and water. Um, what worked, uh, we pretty much uh, executed uh, the whole process of uh, classification cut. 
And what didn't work, we um, couldn't think, uh, distinguish between the mangrove from the water during the classification process. As uh, yeah, the spectros were too similar. It's uh, similar, uh, same as for the the quarries and the and the buildings. Uh, they sort of had a whitish. Uh, <laughs> Next on is um, the questions. What worked well? Um, I think the whole thing uh, was pretty much a success. And um, how many samples did we use? Uh, we used uh, 41 uh, points and 12 polygons to sample around on the island. Um, we used uh, polygons and, and points, and we were gonna use uh, lines as well to um, classify the roads. And the only thing we changed was uh, Tonga, so we used Tonga for the for the um, exercise. And what would you like to do next? Uh, we would like um, to do elevation data analysis for query developments. Um, as here, as here in the land min, uh, Ministry of Lands, we um, we uh, we oversee um, the quarry developments um, here in Tonga, um, calculating the volume extractions and of each quarries. And how much? Uh, how might we you apply to? Um, how might how how might you apply what you have learned um, with this um, um, training? We could uh, use this for land plan, uh, land use planning and changes for Tonga, especially with um, the developments uh, going on at the moment. Tonga is uh, slowly developing, and there's a lot of uh, buildings, especially um, new developments occurring in the rural areas. Um, especially and in, in, in even in the outer islands, uh, especially Vavau and uh, Hapai and Ewa. Uh, what other trainings would you like to get? Um, um, I and my group, we discussed this um, flood, flood inundation modeling. This would be a very useful uh, training for us as um, Tonga is a very vulnerable uh, island, uh, especially with um, Sea level rise. Uh, one of our other islands in uh, out, um, Hapai is um, at risk of um, um, sea level rise, and it's um, also at risk of, um, of flooding, especially with um, um, heavy rain uh, seasons. Most of the households and families are affected by them. Uh, I think that, that that is all. Uh, thank you guys for the training. Appreciate it. Malo. Great. Uh, thank you. Move to the next one. Uh, the Philippines. Does someone from your group want to talk about what you did? Okay. I will present the our group, our work for Philippines, and with us is Lisha from Fiji Island. So we just decided to present to present or do the Philippines since we haven't done or done it with Google Earth. And for the for the questions, what we did basically the land 2019 land cover of the Philippines with just three classes, which are forest and forest and water, and what worked basically everything worked but we have encountered problem on the part we're in and that part on merging syntax, syntax error we're in it shows the error that it's not getting the bonds that we needed so we check on it and then we decided after all the things that we did we decided just to cut syntax that went into manual and it worked fine then it was already discussed earlier, so I think it's good already. And for 
Uh, how many samples did we use per class? We use just one polygon for each class and it has, doesn't have any definite size that we use. Just a, a, a sample of anything of those two three classes and it is very rough. So we're ex expecting a, a rough estimation also of the result, the, uh, what you call that, of the classification, but it's quite very really good. And how do you define your classes? It's just about forest and forest and water. And we change something in the script, like of course the AOI, area of interest, the words, using the words instead of color code and the selection of training pixels. It's basically the one in, in the module. Or do we just try to change the name instead of the color code because we're not familiar with the color codes? What would you like to do next? So to test other classifiers and add more polygons or instead of polygons, you might use points for a better classification of the forest and non-forest and more, more other types of class, land classes that we can identify. So we are thinking that we can apply this in basically classification of land cover here in the Philippines. The other training that would be like to do is to have a, to create a user interface that this platform can be accessed by the local government unit or how can we embed the products of this uh, Google Earth engine into the web, into a website that's in, that is interactive for then easily available for the local government. That's basically it. Then for the result of the classification, you can see it in the in the photos that the water is somehow. I think it it's really it is not really that waterish, but it is a brackish or mangrove areas in the I cannot, in the lower part of Mas um Bataan. And more likely the areas in urban or non-forest areas is only captured urban areas, not the not other type of, or of non-forest classification. Or maybe it does something with the uh, training pixels that we choose. So that's all for the Philippines. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh... All right, that looks like everyone who got to the point of actually making a slide, but I know that not every group got there. Um, is there anyone who didn't get a chance to share who would like to maybe talk about what they did? If not, that's totally fine as well. Uh, so we are at, I guess it's 8 p.m. where I am. Um, so this is whatever time it is where you are, this is the official end point. Uh, so if you need to go, you're free to go. Jeff is going to talk a little bit about uh, some additional resources that we'd like to share with you uh, that will be helpful if you continue to use Earth Engine. Um, so I'm going to hand over to him. Thanks, Ryland. Jeff, uh, Jeff and Ryland, can I ask you a question that might be helpful for people? Like, um, can you just mention very briefly about how, um, if you have two classes that are very similar spectr spectrally, like if you're just looking at Landsat data, how, what sort of auxiliary data you might bring in to a classification routine, just to give people a sense of what options they might have um, to tease apart two different classes that, that look very similar optically from space. Rylan, I'm speechless because I really don't know. It's, it's, it's like truly one of the very hardest things. Um, so sorry ahead, to ask such a hard question. No, I mean, it's an existential question, sort of, right? How do you, if two things look the same, how, do, how can you tell them apart, right? If two things look the same from an airplane, 
and you're flying over it and it looks the same, it's hard to see. Rylan, do you want to maybe say something more uh, constructive, maybe, and scientific, sure. maybe? Um, I guess it depends what your two classes are. We talked a little bit about mangroves uh, earlier when people were in the breakout rooms. And I've never worked with mangroves, but one of the things that came to my mind is that you could include elevation data as a band. So we think mangroves probably look like regular forests, but we know that mangroves only ever occur at really low elevations. There would never be a mangrove at the top of a mountain. So uh, on the first day, Jeff showed uh, the elevation data that you can pull up in Earth Engine. So you could potentially include that as a band in your Landsat data. So you have your seven Landsat bands, and then you add elevation as your fourth band, uh, which would include information that would help to distinguish that. So I think depending on what your classes are, if there's something else like the thing you're looking for that looks similar only appears in a specific area, you could add if you can come up with information that is just in that area, then that can help. But I think, yeah, it's a difficult question. And I don't think that there is a one size fits all solution to the problem. I think it's unique to the two classes that are similar. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a good answer. I think having that, that outside possibility is you know, outside information like elevation, or you can also do with more effort, but you can do spatial, uh, spatial assessments of shapes. Uh, one of the examples I'll show uses whether there are right angles nearby a pixel. So you would say, if I'm in a square of pixels at some scale, this is probably produced by humans. If I'm, and, and so if I can detect a square somewhere surrounding me or a straight edge near me, that changes my probability of being in a, uh, in a human dominated area or a human influenced area. So there are some tools to detect edges in Earth Engine. And with some work, you can get it to, uh, to include those as bands that you would consider in a classification. I would, I would try that uh, as well. But in, in Canada, for example, it's very hard to distinguish old forest from regrowing forest. That's true in a lot of places, I'm sure. But one of the things that we spend a lot of time looking at is you look at it and it basically looks green, but you know that it was cut maybe four years ago, three or four years ago. In our case, we have uh, grass grows back very quickly and then coniferous forests are planted, which then grow over a 40 year period. But it looks like forest very soon. After about a year, it's pretty hard to tell the difference between just this open grass, which is a little bit like what is behind Paul, at least from a distance. That looks like there's not gigantic trees. It looks more like grassland. But from above, it's green, the same green as forest typically looks. So those are, we hit those same challenges everywhere in the world that we do our work. So, okay. If it's okay, I would like to show uh, some some uh, tools that you can use to launch yourself forward from this point and then finish and say thanks to everyone. Um, I will share my screen. I'm gonna share this one. And that should be hopefully a thing that says Quebec uh, harmonics on it, at least for a moment. Um, yeah, it's there. Great, I'll move that out of the way and you should see what next. Um, so, this is, if you see at the very top, part one, Earth Engine Training. This is back to our home page. You can come here uh, anytime you want. This will be here for the long term. We have this page here on slide 16 in order for you to be able to see this enormous amount of resources that have been created mostly by, well, almost entirely by other people, uh, but that they are part of the Earth Engine 
teaching and learning uh, community of people. Uh, the first is the Earth Engine User's Guide, which I will click on here and go over here. We can see off to the right how to get started with Earth Engine. Talks through the code editor, opening and running code in the code editor. Now to you as experts or as new experts, this really looks probably pretty familiar. Here's uh, a DEM, a digital elevation model. You did that with your shuttle radar topography uh, mission data. Uh, here's hello world, that probably looks familiar. This is a little bit of, a, it's a similar, uh, maybe descendant of the one that we have. So this teaches people some of those same things that you just saw today and yesterday really, I guess. So that is the kind of thing that's available at the user's guide. It also goes much, much, much deeper than that also. Uh, I'll show you this Earth Engine at Stack Exchange. I just used this uh, yesterday or the day before. Um, here is a question for where can I get uh, high resolution satellite images at free or low cost? Um, how do I create a path? Like how do I create a string, a certain type of string in Earth Engine? That's something that makes some sense to us now. How do I stack up bands in Google Earth Engine? You can make your own multi-banded images. Um, how can I get just January data from 2000 to 2010? So these are the same kinds of questions that you and I have. And I went in here to look up something uh, that would sound pretty similar to you if I dragged you uh, into that, that hole that I had when I was confused. So what I do, I just Google Stack Exchange and then my question. And that almost always has paid off for me. Um, it's also possible to run Earth Engine at the command line if you need to um, generate a lot of maps that can be useful. It's a little bit outside of the scope of what we are doing now, I would say, but it's worth knowing about. Also, uh, here are the ladies of Landsat. This is one of uh, my students runs this uh, thing on Twitter that highlights uh, work done by women all around the world who use remote sensing. And it's really cool. They come out with a new, um, new article each week to highlight uh, work of theirs. And then these other pieces, there are podcasts, all kinds of just really neat stuff. It's, uh, I'm proud to be, uh, to have that, to be able to call her my student is kind of silly because she is super amazing. So she is her own uh, dynamo. Uh, so we also, um, at the American Geophysical Union, they uh, have uh, a booth. So Google rents a gigantic booth and you can go here and see these talks. Uh, it's possible to find uh, links to video for these talks and for uh, things like that. You can find those. I think that's pretty helpful. If you want to click and learn about my lab anymore or really to contact us if you have any questions, that's an easy place. I think our, our emails are also on the first page, but if you wanna learn any of those things, um, that's a great place to do it. Also, uh, with, um, with Dave Saw, who is in the Severe program, some of you may know him, uh, he and I are editing, I'll change that from writing to editing a book, uh, Cloud Computing with Google Earth Engine Fundamentals and Applications. Uh, we're gonna make that free for everyone. It will be an open access book and it will be filled with tutorials like what you saw here. Um, the first half of the book, about 20 chapters, uh, will there will be like 20 chapters like what you did yesterday. 15 steps explaining particular parts. Uh, and then the second half will be applications. So we'll have something on air quality and forest work and water and fire and insects and deforestation and mining, uh, all kinds of anything that is an interesting application. Uh, that will be available sometime in the year 2022 and it will be free forever. Um, here uh, might be an interesting spot. I think I clicked on this rapid classification of croplands. Uh, you can click on those. These are more uh, examples. And here, I believe if we were to go to supervise classification, that's what you just did, where you train a classifier. Uh, there is some work uh, there. I think that's an hour long video. There are, hour, there are hours of hour long videos created by Google 
where they explain what uh, the technologies are in Earth Engine. And so we mentioned those and like everything else in this workshop that will always be here for you to see also. To finish or to almost finish, I wanna show you um, a little bit of how we solve problems when we're stuck. So we've looked at the scripts page. Uh, let me show you the assets page. These are results that we have saved into uh, sort of like Google documents that we have saved into our space. So this is work, a lot of it is just testing work that we've done, but also whenever we do final work, we save it here as an asset. That allows us to share it with other people. Uh, we can make an app to view an asset and it would, the asset would sit in this place. Uh, here you can see this is some real code that I was writing today. I was going to show that off to everyone, but there's a bug and it doesn't work in this spot. I'm trying to draw a curved line through these points. Uh, I'm using a chart like you saw from Mary, using the merge tool like you did today. In this case, I'm merging together images or merging image collections together, drawing charts like you see over here, over here with layers, writing uh, you know 30 layers to the screen, clicking on them, going through the inspector, all of the same techniques that you now can recognize, even if you maybe aren't going to write a script that looks like this, you can at least recognize what it is that I'm doing. Here, this merge command, what is it? How did I know to use it? Because when I started, I didn't know how to use it. So I looked up image collection uh, and I saw that this is a way to merge two collections of images together. In my code, uh, I make a list, if you can see here, it says the year equals 2016. Then I wrote a function. This is the name of my function. It takes four parameters. Now you know those things. One of, I wrote another function here. I like long, long function names so that I can remember what they do. Here that takes two parameters. One of them is a string. So now you know it's in red, it's a string. Uh, then I set it down there and then down at the bottom, uh, I calculate all of these years. I'm trying to find the patterns in years. That's the idea. Uh, and so I say I want an empty collection and please merge together 2015 from Landsat 8, 2016 from Landsat 8, and 2016 from Sentinel 2. Put them into one image collection. And we do that. So that is over here under merge. The version of merge that you used is here under feature collection. You had uh, forest and non-forest and water. You had polygons of those. Those were individual features and you wanted to merge or feature collections and you merge them together into one long list of information. And so that is how it works. One thing that you notice here that uh, is true throughout Earth Engine is that the format is typically, you have a noun and then a period and then a verb. So image collection, dot or period, then the verb called merge. If I take out the word merge and just say, well, show me everything in the docs area. <clears throat> here it is here, here under images. What can we do with an image? We can add bands to an image. Probably map.add layer is in here, I think, I hope. Uh, oh, that's in a different place, sorry. You can multiply two images together. That's a verb that we could do. There are higher math uh, operations that can be done with matrix algebra. We do a, like one call of that in my lab. You can do a maximum between two values by doing this image dot max parentheses and then whatever the other image is. Uh, our greater than is probably in here. Uh, there's the GT that you used on the first day where you said, I want all of the locations that are greater than 2000 in this area. That's what the GT does. And this is how we know that it exists. Uh, and that's because I'm scrolling upward now into image. That is an operation that can be done with images. Um, all of that stuff exists. And this is what, this is part of what Mary used to make that interface. The other part of what she used to make the interface that you saw is here at the bottom. These are all scripts that are in our lab. So uh, yours is hopefully still pretty short. 
and you can find your way through it. Uh, down at the very bottom, past the reader here under examples. Under examples, there are examples of all kinds of things. Uh, Rylan showed or mentioned one uh, earlier for the clouds and shadows, I think. There are ones here under user interface, and this specifically is what Mary used in order to learn how to make a chart. Somewhere in here, it says to chart inspector. That's what she used for it, and that's what this other student, Aiden, used to make these charts. Now, earlier today, I was clicking here, and I discovered it did not make a sine wave through these points. How can I tell Aiden about it? We're in the middle of some place in Canada, but I want him to see my code. So how do I do that? What I did was, first of all, I took a screen capture of it. Uh, I clicked on this point, took a screen capture. So I see this point is a little larger than the other points. But mostly what I did was I clicked Get Link. Uh, I click Get Link, and it brings up a little window, and the window is a copy. I click Copy. I sent him an email, and I put that link in there, and I said, why isn't this thing making the chart? Let's discuss it tomorrow when we meet. So this is a way that you can save or make a, a mark in your work and send it to somebody else so that they can help discuss it with you. Uh, and so this is like the real life of how we program in Earth Engine. So I mentioned that there are examples. Here are some of the examples that exist. One is called Forest Change. Here it is right here under User Interface. Now here, they are talking about the global forest change data set that was produced at the university uh, by a professor at the University of Maryland uh, in I think the year 2016. This is being updated. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing data set. You can select the year of loss, whether it lost over some time period or not. And here it shows the year of lost of loss. And this is deforestation in Paraguay. Now, of course, at the scale of all of the world, very few places have lost or gained uh, forest. But if we zoom in into that area, near that area that I showed you before, uh, with the three images flying around, we can see that at least from the year 2000 to 2016, this is what forest was changed in the Amazon. So this data set is available to everyone. This is just a viewer into that data set. Uh, earlier, someone had asked me, if I, if I finish a project and I want to share it with someone, can I do that? Yes, that's what this is. This shows um, an existing asset, and then they made an interface on top of it to view that asset. So this is something that, um, that Mary, for example, or Cash, with three weeks, two weeks of work, uh, in my lab could make this, maybe even a week of work could make something like this. The reason is that all of the code for making it exists here if you just move the code editor out of the way. So this is 200 lines of code. Me, if I needed to do it, I would sort of copy this into my own space and then try to change it a little bit at a time and hit run and try to get my data into this existing structure. You can do that here for this is called linked maps. This is another example under the scripts examples. This shows four different views. Rylan earlier today showed you the color infrared view of somewhere and showed you the natural color view of, uh, well, the Solomons, but uh, this is a different place. I guess that's New Orleans maybe. Uh, and it shows here natural color in this corner, color infrared here, a different combination of bands, and a third combination of bands, band 12 and band 11 and band 4. What's really neat about this is that these maps are connected to each other through some type of programming. Uh, this is not in New Orleans, given those names for sure. Uh, and so we can see here in this location, um, we can do it. We can move in and out however we want. It's not for really action, but it's for viewing and understanding the landscape that you have. Uh, the last example I'll show you is this thing called split panel. This also has a bunch of code here. It's only 80 lines of code. All right. And it can show us uh, 
before and after. It's designed to show before and after. If I move this slider left and right, uh, someone at Google on this team, on their team, wrote this. And what, however they did it, this is what it does. It moves, allows us to move the slider from left and right. We can choose an image on the left and an image on the right uh, and view the different changes. Here they've limited it to just four images, but you could take it and put in your own image collection on the left and on the right. And in fact, uh, Cash took this example and brought it into my lab uh, and is helps us to be able to view our specific data. And he did it with two days of work maybe. Uh, so I mentioned those because they are really powerful and the sort of system that they built in Earth Engine is amazingly powerful. And I think is still growing. It's fully growing. It seems extremely solid as well. And I think it will exist for a long time. Um, if I'm in the right spot, is it linear regression for the, the lights, Rylan? I think I forget and go to the wrong place every time. Do you remember? Uh, yes, I think it's probably that. Um, somehow, no. Some other regression. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I think instead, I'm just going to go back and summarize for us what we've done. I'm now going to go all the way back to the home slide, which is slide three. So to finish, uh, we're now at the end of these two days. Okay, we've showed you, shown you um, what is Google Earth Engine? You remember we began by talking about the infrastructure that they have and that the sign up that we make allows us to run programs on their infrastructure. We've described the API. That was, oh right, I'm probably gone from there now. I'm gonna move back over. Is that better? That's better. Thanks, Rylan. Um, so if I go bigger now, you can see that, I suppose, hopefully. Yeah, that's, Is that, that's there. Okay, great. Um, so we've talked about what is Google Earth Engine. Um, we talked about the, um, the ability to run the API. Maybe some of you knew that term and some didn't. That's the application programming interface. That's where you've spent the last couple of days uh, writing programs. So you are application programmers now at this point by using their interface. Uh, we then, uh, after the little break, we then began by printing hello world for JavaScript. We learned a bunch of JavaScript and then launched you into making calls on Google servers, which now feels very natural to just download 1000 images or to access a thousand images. Um, and with Rylan, what we did on day two was to sort of squeeze those 1000 images and get a nice clear result from one particular year. So we did, uh, you did the rapid land cover classification first as a group uh, and then in your individual groups for an area that was interesting. Along the way, all of us saw that it's a lot more complicated. You don't get a result after half an hour, but I think don't get a satisfying result after half an hour. But what I think Earth Engine does for me is it allows me to do, to explore and to do experiments. Instead of spending six months preparing to try to do something, I spend an hour trying to do something. Uh, and it feels much more uh, liberating and free to get to try out these little ideas that we have. And so we've already taken the photo, so we won't do that. And so I will just finish by showing again what is next, and then I will go all the way back to the very, very top uh, and say thank you. Um, so your hosts, uh, Paul, I should have your name on here, of course, for sure. Uh, Paul has sort of run the show, did all of the signups, got everybody uh, excited and enthusiastic, and also at the very last minute, figured out what the heck to do and whether to cancel the whole thing. And so really, um, he might say thanks to us, but really it's because of him that you got this workshop to happen. 
Um, he could have just said, uh, it's too complicated. Let's just skip it and do it some other time. But he worked hard in order to find people to do it. We're really happy to have done it, but also to take all of the organizing that was done and to get something good out of it. So we are really happy to have laid the groundwork uh, for Noel to come in in the third part. So in the third part, he will show up. You will now know what is happening, right? You will know when he says, we have a lot of points, you have a lot of points. You can say, yeah, are they feature collections? And he'll say, oh, yeah, I think they are. They must be feature collections. Um, and then you can work together um, in order to be a lot closer to the outcome than you than you uh, will be than you would be if you didn't already have these two starting uh, days. So, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and say thank you very much. And I really uh, hope that we will someday all meet in person. Maybe we'll see you in uh, in Canada, or maybe see you in the United States somewhere at a conference or maybe we will come to visit you uh, where you live. So thanks again very much. It really uh, was a lot of fun and I, I really enjoyed it a lot. And it's fun to imagine seeing everyone in real life and next time going out to dinner after this and just spending some time together uh, relaxing and enjoying it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jeff and Ryland.